a Yankee fan came up to me and said, you know, I'm still going to chant 1918. And I said, well, then you're an idiot. There's no more there's curse. No, there's no, no more. Curse? What curse? What curse? There's no such thing. It's over. The whole Bambino thinks they're sham. Past history. 86 years it took us to bring it home. There's no more jinx, no more hex, no more monkey on their back. Thank God. Screw the curse. We had swept aside so much crap. The balloon home run. Bucky Dan. Babe Ruth. No oh God. That's gone. Sayonara. And for the biggest comeback in baseball history against the stinking Yankees. The curse is over. This is turning my whole world upside down. World champions, yeah, baby. And Boston is going crazy. The curse is broken. For more than a hundred years, the Boston Red Sox, the Old Town team, has been the most interesting in baseball. With a rich and often painful past that's been both complex and endearing, the history of the Red Sox is woven in the fabric of each of the six New England states. Its story embedded in the generations. Baseball is a religion in New England. Its cathedral, a ballpark built in 1912, is as famous as the team itself. Given the Red Sox success through the years, it's hard to believe that Boston fans went so long before finally seeing their team win the World Series. For the first time in 86 years, can you believe it? What was it? Eight decades, it just seemed like an eternity. Before their magical championship in 2004, the Sox had taken the Fall Classic to its limit four times, and four times lost game seven, each more painful than the one before. Whoever came up with the phrase, long suffering, had Red Sox fans in mind. Until the dream was realized, being a Sox fan was far, far from easy. It was more like a living nightmare. You grow up in this town. Your parents are Red Sox fans. Your grandparents are Red Sox fans. You become a Red Sox fan. And you get tortured for the rest of your life. Being a Red Sox fan is like a Charles Dickens novel. Everyone is just trying to survive the situation. For me, there's a psychological war in my own mind dealing with each season. Did you just say 1986 to me? The assumption that something bad will happen, that every Red Sox ship has a leak and every leak is big enough to sink the ship. Every year you say, well, they're not gonna get me again. They're not gonna get me again. Then all of a sudden you go, I think this is it. And they got you again, and then, bango, you're in the toilet again. It's almost an existential motif, the myth of Sisyphus, where you're rolling that rock up a hill, and you think you're finally there. It rolls right down again. Everybody remembers the story of Job. Job is this guy whose life is going great, and all of a sudden, he loses all his property. His children are sick. The Red Sox are Job. You know, this is a Jobian existence. Um, everything's going fine, and then all of a sudden, Boom. It's not just loss, but crushing, crushing, crushing loss. It's like watching The Wizard of Oz, and then Dorothy dies at the end. You know, doesn't this die? She's like ripped apart by the flying monkeys, and Toto eats her remains, and the end, credits roll. Masochism. It's masochism. It's sadomasochism. If the good guy dies in the end in every production since 1918, you might get a little fatalistic, don't you think? Strange as it seems, some Sox fans actually believe there was an unnatural reason for the monumental disappointments, that perhaps a powerful force from the past had cursed their storied franchise. 
What else could explain the suffering and lament that followed the Sox since the heady days of 1918 and before? When the Boston Red Sox, the very same Boston Red Sox who disappointed their fans with such regularity, were launched as a dynasty. When Ban Johnson created the American League, he determined very early on that the team in Boston was going to be one of his flagship franchises. Boston had this aura that they were the team that was always going to win. One way or another, Boston was going to come out on top. With great pitching and defense, Boston won five of the first 15 World Series, including 1903, with the immortal Cy Young on the mound. In 1912, the Sox christened Fenway Park with a second championship, and won again in 1915, 1916, and 1918. The pitching star of that team was Babe Ruth, who the Sox had bought from an industrial league in Baltimore in 1914. Ruth was only 19 years old, but he won big right away. He won 18 games. The next year, 1916 and 1917, he won 23 and 24 games. In the World Series in 1918, he pitched a shutout and then pitched seven scoreless innings to extend his scoreless streak to 29 innings, which was the record for more than 40 years. He was a sensational pitcher, but his hitting began to take over, and he loved to hit. He loved the sense of hitting. In 1919, the Babe led the American League with 29 home runs, more than all but five teams in baseball. Ruth was the Red Sox principal attraction, the team's biggest draw. But prior to the 1920 season, Boston owner Harry Frazee, a New York theater producer, sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. That single transaction defined the Red Sox franchise, and Frazee, from that moment on, he was pegged Boston's all-time villain, the buffoon who peddled the babe. He cared more about his theater ventures than he did his baseball team, and saw a chance to get a lot of cash and had to go with it. It was sad news. They were taking all their chance of winning in the big leagues out of their hands. They were turning it over to New York. New York never was able to, to, uh, to beat the Red Sox before this. The Red Sox could never beat New York after the sale either. Ruth goes there, they build the ballpark, and they become this dynasty. Frizzi's name becomes mud, and the Red Sox go the exact opposite direction, they become the worst they ever were. In terms of his obligation to the fans, I don't see how he can be defended. Almost everything that people think they know about Harry Frazee is thoroughly incorrect. According to the legend, Frazee was this failed theatrical producer, was just a real screw-up who bought the Red Sox and didn't really have the money to do it, really didn't care about baseball. He's broke, he needs to pay his bills, and he has no money. So he sold Babe Ruth, his only big commodity. So they sell him for money so that they can fund a play in New York. I mean, it's ludicrous. He took the money and he produced a musical called No No Nanette. Not only do I hate that musical, but I hate all musicals. I remember as a kid, I hated Nanette Fabray. And whenever I heard her name, I'd go, ah, hate her. Hate her. Just based on the first name. If there was no play, then we could have kept him for the whole time. It's just so bad that they had to trade him just for this one play. Ari Frizee was sitting in a taxi, and he was bragging that he'd sold Ruth, and the cab driver slammed the brakes, pulled him out, and punched him in the nose. All of that is incorrect. The notion that Ruth was sold to produce No No Nanette, which wasn't on Broadway for five more years. It's just absurd. But Perry Frizee becomes the perfect patsy in this town because he's from New York and he's dead. Whether or not one is wild about Harry, there's little dispute about the success of the two teams after the trade. Until the fall of 2004, the world championship count stood Yankees 26, Red Sox zero. That gap, the almost incomprehensible divide between the fortunes of the two close rivals 
left many fans in Boston intensely bitter. And, if you think about it, understandably envious. If you had seen all those championship flags, you'd have been jealous too. You have to have a villain in all great shows. And the Yankees are the villain. The Yankees are evil. They're oil, they're insurance companies. They're everything that we don't like in our life. I mean hate, like hatred. Like that bad quality in human beings to hate. I hate them. I hate Yankee fans. I hate their team. I'm filled with rage. If you had said to my dad that one day we would watch Wade Boggs riding a horse around Yankee Stadium to celebrate his championship with the Yankees, his head would have blown up. In the Red Sox 86 years of disappointment, many at the hands of the Yankees, seasons came and went, but not 1978. This is supposed to be the best team they've ever had. They're just blowing everybody out. Just pedal to the metal. The Red Sox couldn't do anything wrong. The Yankees couldn't do anything right. I was working in Jacksonville, Florida, and when the Red Sox were 14 and a half games in front, I decided to quit my job down there to come home because I wanted to be at home when the Red Sox finally won the whole thing. Everything seemed great. And then... September came, and somebody turned the baseball world upside down. It was a gradual decline, like somebody with a disease getting sicker by the day. The Yankees started crawling up in the standings. The Red Sox were creeping down. You could hear them coming. You could see them coming. You knew that it was going to come down to that four-game series in September. The Yankees rolled into town, scored like 100,000 runs. took their bats from the on-deck circle and beat each member of the Red Sox over the head with them. It was ugly. It's forever been known as the Boston Massacre. The Yanks outscored the Sox 42-9 in that four-game sweep. Boston was down, but not out, and fought back to tie the Yankees on the last day of the season. That set up a one-game playoff, New York versus Boston at Fenway. The winner takes the division. After six, the Sox led 2-0. Then in the seventh, with two on and two out, up came the unimposing Bucky Dent. Tension eases somewhat here at Fenway. With two out in the shortstop, Bucky Dent coming up. I can remember that moment when Bucky Dent came up and thinking, this is no problem. You know, we're out of the inning. Fouls his pitch off his foot. He's hopping around like the three stooges were all laughing at him. I mean, just waiting for the guy to get put away. But Dent, the previous pitch, broke his bat. It was a long pause while he went to get another bat. While he was putting the pine tar on it, instead of warming up, Torres is just standing there. He's gazing around, looking at the crowd. la dee da dee da And as soon as Dent gets back into the batter's box, the next pitch, boom. And as soon as the ball lofted into the air, it's a pop-up, it's a fly ball. Everybody thought it was a fly ball. But then it started to sail, drifts and sail, and drifts and sail. And Stramski goes back. Oh, no. He goes back. Oh, no. He's right next to the wall. And it just dropped into the screen ever so softly. Ball hit hard to left field. Yastrzemski goes back. He looks up. It's going to be out of here. A home run for Bucky Dent. You can see Yastrzemski's knees buckle. He physically slumps as if he'd been punched in the stomach. And then I saw him go down to his knees and punch the ground, and it was like the air went out of the ballpark. It was this incredible silence. You could actually hear Steinbrenner clapping by the dugout. It was so quiet elsewhere in the park. It was amazing, and of all the hitters, this guy had hit four home runs all year. Bucky Dent. Bucky Dent was like to some utility schmo. And obviously, he's just become part of the language up here in Boston. Bucky Dent. Bucky Dent! The name sounds like a swear, doesn't it? Bucky Dent. You Bucky Dent. You Bucky Dent bastard. Yeah, Jesus. He has a new middle name, which you're not allowed to say on TV. Bucky Bleepin' Dent. Bucky Bleepin' Dent. Maybe you can say it on HBO. Bucky f***ing Dent. Every time I go up there, they always put my middle initial up there. You know, BF Dent. <laughs> 
As if Dent's homer wasn't torture enough, the game rested in the arms of Boston's hero, Carl Yastrzemski. Two down, Burleson at third, five to four, Yankees, bottom of the ninth inning. And he pops it up, Greg Nettles, he makes the catch. And the, the headline in the paper was, Destiny five, Red Sox four. And I thought, that says it all. October 2nd, 1978 is a gloomy day for the Boston Red Sox. Historically, the Boston Red Sox had been anything but Destiny's team. Fate, fortune, divine intervention, others had that, not the Sox. Providence, that's in Rhode Island. Doomsday prophecies, infamous figures, acts of chronic folly. Now that was Red Sox baseball. Most folks believe you could have traced the start of the Sox misfortune to the 46 series, game seven. Johnny Pesky holds the ball for a split second while Enos Slaughter scores the series winning run all the way from first. Why didn't he throw home? Two years later, Denny Galehouse was mysteriously picked to start a playoff game against the Indians. Why him, a nobody, while other more worthy pitchers sat? Of course, Denny was bombed. The Indians went to the 48 series, and the Sox went home. How about Luis Saparicio, a guy the Sox got for his legs, slipping as he heads for home? Instead of scoring, Luis scrambles back, finds a confused Yaz at third, and the 72 pennant goes up in smoke. Sadly, there's more. Who else but the Sox could have dreamed the impossible dream than woke up only to be reminded of this nightmare, the horror of seeing Tony Canigliero, New England's own Tony C, his career shattered in the blink of an eye. And what other team could have taken one of the great moments in World Series history? Stay fair, stay fair, and trump that October magic with October misery. Bad karma, rotten luck. Until 2004, it didn't seem to matter. Plain and simple, it was just Red Sox baseball. Fans see them as a continuum in this long soap opera comic tragedy that's unfolded over the last 80 years. There is some connection between what happens now and what happened in 1978 and what happened in 1949 and what happened in 1919. There is some common thread that runs through here. Why do all these bad things happen to the Red Sox? All these things cannot be coincidences. There's some higher power at work. There's a conspiracy here somewhere. There is some kind of a curse. There is a curse. Do I believe in curses? In my business? A little bit. Never should have traded Ruth, man. Never should have traded him. He cursed us. It's the only thing that seems out there. You know, different players have come and gone, different general managers. The one thing that never changes is Babe Ruth was defamed, the greatest ball player who ever lived. this close as many times, you just start to look toward the larger forces. That's what the curse is about, superstition over science. It's just a fun way to explain the unexplainable, which is the Red Sox. A classic case a couple years ago, Pedro Martinez calls out the babe for no apparent reason. I don't believe in them curses. Wake up the dumb bambino and have me face him. Maybe I'll drill him in the eye. <laughs> Pedro gets hurt, never wins another game the rest of the year. Don't be taunting the big guy. Whether or not one chose to believe in the afterlife, or in this case, the curse of the Bambino, this much was true. Over time, Red Sox Nation was divided between those who obsessed over the curse and those who completely denied it. Can you believe this?
this a play based on the misfortunes of the Red Sox. Oh, I can't take it anymore. And they call it, what else? The Curse of the Bambino. Let's face it, some of the best theater has been based in tragedy. You better watch out, Harry, because the band is leaving town. When I was going to Mount Everest base camp, I said to my wife, I'm going to talk to the Lama over in Nepal. And I said, this guy's got incredible powers. And I told him, I want to break the curse of the Bambino. And he told me what to do. Put the Red Sox cap on the summit, which he blessed, and take the Yankees cap back down the base camp and burn it as an offering to the gods. The Red Sox were still in first place, and then they fell apart. You had to have kind of a mass curse removal festival. Kiss the ground that babe is being grown in. That's what we were trying to provide was a place where people could come and walk around the babe and walk through the babe's hat and the babe's eyes and up through his nose and his broad shoulders. And, you know, maybe by giving the babe a little walking over, you could help lift the spirit. As soon as we opened with the babe, we had bad weather. We had vandalism. We've never had vandalism before. We became cursed, I think, a little bit for trying to exercise the curse. It's a serene spot west of Boston that may just hold the key to the curse of the Bambino. It is well documented that Babe Ruth rented this cottage here in Sudbury during his time with the Red Sox, and he loved to party with family and friends here. We also understand sometime during the winter of 1917, 1918, he was hanging around the piano playing with friends as well as his wife when he suddenly thought it would be hilarious to somehow get that piano from the cottage down to the lake. The Babe did get it out onto the ice, but either it broke or the ice melted, and this is where the piano now sits. The piano has been at the bottom of this pond for 85 years, or as long as the Red Sox haven't won a World Series. If we can find it and restore it, perhaps the baseball gods will look favorably upon this and grant us a World Series. So if there's a curse breaker, I feel the piano is it. So far, dive teams have scoured the area unsuccessfully. As a metaphor for the futility of the Red Sox, it's got a nice ring to it. But their failures have nothing whatsoever to do with Babe Ruth. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. There's no curse of the Bambino. It's not some evil force or some curse. There's always an incident you can point at. Bill Lee did not throw the right pitch. There's his blooper pitch. There it is. A high drive. He's waiting for that one. That one is gone over everything. He made the mistake out there. No curse, nothing overtook Billy's body, though I do believe aliens might have at one time. This whole idea of diving for a piano and creating all this utter nonsense is an insult to anyone's intelligence. You know, unless you're a nitwit. Typical, thumb-sucking New England ragtime. Why are the baseball gods so fickle? Why are we treated this way? Ah, what was this? When, blah, blah, blah. P.W.N.C. Sears. Provincial, whining, narcissistic, chronic complainers. Anything but the facts are used as a crutch, as an excuse for why they haven't won. We're cursed. And maybe it's easier to accept a curse. It takes the heat off. Better to point fingers and say it's the damn Bambino. <laughs> it's Harry Frazee. Yeah, that's why. That's the attraction of the curse. It seems to explain everything. It's cute. It fits. Oh, that's why we've lost. We don't have to examine the real history. If you study the real history of the club, you'll realize that there's a reason why they've won and lost. You win or lose by who picks your talent. You bring in the best players, you win. You give me the best team and you can have the curse on your side. We'll see who wins. It's difficult to know for sure why it took the Sox 86 years to win the World Series. Looking back, there were a lot of reasons, starting with the very place Sox fans most identify with, their beloved home, Fenway Park. Anyone who's been around the team for a period of time has to acknowledge that the ballpark has hurt this franchise in many, many more ways than it has helped. They have almost always tried to tailor the team to the contours of the ballpark. 
the green monster, the left field wall, big right-handed hitter, strong, get ball over the wall. The Red Sox, over the years, have gone out and tried to get that certain individual, that certain player, who has that perfect Fenway Park swing. Let's get that guy, because you know what? He's hitting 35 home runs now. We bring him in here, he can hit 55 with that swing. Jimmy Fox, Rudy York, Dick Gurnett, Walter Dropo, Vern Stevens. Dick Stewart was the first one I remember. He was everything you'd expect from a right-handed slugger with the Red Sox. He didn't care about anything except hitting home runs. Over the years, they have been this big, slow, lumbering type of team. And they never quite got it, that the way you win the whole thing is have the best pitching. If you play half your games in Fenway Park, you have to have great pitching. But there's something else to consider. The Red Sox shameful scorecard on race relations. I grew up in Dorchester, which is a predominantly black neighborhood, and we were a mile and a half away from Fenway, but we had never been to games. Nobody talked about going to games. None of the adults rooted for the Red Sox. My uncle used to tell me, why would I go to Fenway just to get beat up? If you really look at the history of the Boston Red Sox, it's not a lot of fun. Actually, it was appalling. The Red Sox were the last team in the majors to embrace integration when Pumpsy Green finally came to Boston in the middle of 1959. That's a full 12 years after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, more than two after he retired. Much of the blame was pinned on owner Tom Yockey, a transplanted Southerner who fostered an attitude of institutional racism that would haunt the Sox still decades after he was gone. Everybody is always asking, in terms of Tom Yockey, well, where's the smoking gun? Where's the document where he uses the N-word? Yockey didn't leave a document like that, but he did leave a document. He left a document on the field for decades. Just look at it. You know, you want proof? There it is. But no matter how the Sox decades of futility is explained, in three of Boston's World Series appearances, 1946, 1967, and 1975, just one more win and we'd have never heard of the curse of the Bambino. You could say the same about 1986, except 86 was so unnerving, so surreal. That's when even the most ardent realists began to think Maybe there was something to the curse. It started in the postseason. AL Championship. Sox down three games to one. In the ninth, down three, Boston rallied. With two outs, the Sox still trailed 5-4 when Donnie Moore came in to face Dave Henderson. To left field and deep. I can just see him just floating. I was babysitting my new niece, Amanda, and I went crazy. I woke her up and she was screaming. And um, but I told her it was all for a good cause. Those things never happened to the Red Sox. Finally, it's our turn. Finally, we have a storybook finish, pulling out of the coffin and crush some other team's heart. The Sox went on to win the series in seven games a reprieve of sorts for several decades of futility. The comeback in the playoffs in 86 should have enabled them to forever put the idea of them being chokers behind. It should have been history. This team throws off all odds and comes back and beats you. The World Series was next. And there was New York again. Only this time, the light at the end of the tunnel wasn't the Yanks, it was the Mets. With the Sox up three games to two, game six went into the 10th inning. And again, Dave Henderson hit a dramatic homer. They even added another to take a 5-3 lead. Three more outs. The Red Sox needed just three more outs. Wally Bachman came up. He flied out to Jim Rice, and I can still see Rice with the two hands catching it and bringing it down. One out. One away. And then Keith Hernandez came up. 
Center with Henderson going to run it down. You know, got the two hands, and he has that little flip into the infield. October 25th, 1986, bottom of the 10th, Red Sox up 5-3. Two out was Gettysburg, July 3rd, right before Pickett's charge. It was really possible at that moment. I was down in the bowels of Shea Stadium. I watched them roll those carts of champagne into that locker room. I watched them put the World Championship t-shirts on everybody's seat. It was sewn up. It was going to be the ultimate purging of everything. They stood on the bar. I'm going to have a heart attack. I was sobbing. I'm jumping up and down. We'd get off the sofa, get off our chairs. My nails were dug into my hands. I've waited my whole life for this. And all the people around me couldn't imagine why I was crying. And my brother turned around and he said, oh, she was the same way in 1918. I couldn't believe that my team was going to win. I was ecstatic. People all over New England are holding babies in front of television screens. I woke my son. I could not let him sleep. He would never forgive me. I carried him from the room. I brought him over to the couch. And I told him, come see something nobody's seen in 70 years. And the Mets are down to their last out. And Gary Carter at the plate. My brother picks up the telephone and starts dialing my uncle in New Jersey, who's the big Mets fan. The second the last out is made, they rush the field and the champagne comes out, his phone's going to ring. It's going to be us rubbing it in his face. My brother was just dialing. Do, 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 do. And then had his thumb over the last number. And he pops it foul. Damn it. Getting one over and there was a chance to make a play and I remember thinking, no, 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 I don't want it to end on a foul pop to the catcher. I want it to be classic. I want it to be a strikeout. And when the ball ended in the seats, I thought, great. Boop, 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 boop. Lined into left field, base hit for Carter. Oh, I remember Vin Scully saying, and the Mets are still alive. I said, yeah, right. And with two out, representing the tying run, Kevin Mitchell. I don't think Kevin Mitchell was wearing a cup or a jock or anything. He had been in the clubhouse making plane reservations back to San Diego. He was drinking a beer with Keith Hernandez. Third ball, and that's going to be hit to center, base hit. And now suddenly with two out in the 10th inning, the tying runs are aboard, and Ray Knight will be the batter. And now we're starting to sweat a little bit. There was this sort of like pit at the bottom of your stomach forming. The hair start to prickle on the back of your neck. All I thought was, get it out. Get it out. Get it out. Chiraldi's expression was like me in algebra class when I was called for my homework. My brother kept dialing. And that's going to be hitting the center field, base hit. What? Comes Carter to score. Oh, I can't believe this, but no, they're not going to blow this. It's impossible. And the Mets refuse to go quietly. Sox and he's McNamara also... comes out, it signals for the bullpen, the gate opens up, and out comes Stanley. And I screamed, uh oh, uh oh, no, no. Oh, God. Oh, shit. There's ever a guy that just epitomized a Red Sox loser dumb, Bob Stanley. He just had that sad, kind of droopy face. You have the tying run 90 feet away, and here's Mookie. Fouled off. He got two strikes on Mookie. They get to one strike away, not Fouled once. Away. Not twice, out away. but three times. Tension mount some more. With two out in the tenth. Five, four Red Sox. Ray Knight at first. My quadriceps are tense. My patellas are bursting. My back's hurting because I haven't been able to jump up yet. My brother, to his credit, kept dialing each pitch. But you got the sense of, oh shit, something's going to happen. It's going to go to the backstop. <laughs> Here comes Mitchell to score the tying run. What happened? What just happened? I watched them wheel that champagne back out and grab those t-shirts and stuff them back in the bag. It was really like a horror film. I couldn't believe my eyes. We couldn't have dreamt this thing up. I just turned to the bartender and said, give me everything on the top shelf and put it in a big glass. No, it can't be happening. It just can't be happening. But it was. My brother hung up the phone, and there was a sense of, 
this game's lost. So the winning run is at second base with two out, three and two to Mookie Wilson. And then the unbelievable happened. The whole world slowed down for me. It stopped time. It was like watching a slow motion car accident. It just couldn't have really happened. It had to have been a movie or somebody's idea of a cruel joke. I was in complete, utter catatonic shock. My son just collapsed. I picked him up and he was just sobbing. I felt like I done the worst thing to him a human being could do. I mean, to do that to your kid. I didn't say a word. I just got up from the sofa, and I walked up two flights of stairs to the bedroom, threw myself face first onto the bed, uncontrollably crying. I was so upset. It really was an hour and a half after the game ended before I could even move. That really pissed me off. Really pissed me off really, really pissed me off. I was back in the third grade in the Police Athletic League in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and my coach was saying, glove to the ground, glove to the ground. And I thought to myself, how can he not know this? Glove to the ground, come on, pick up the ball. I just went over, turned off the TV, and told my wife that I was gonna take a good long walk. I needed some solitude. What I didn't count on was the fact that there would be hundreds of Bostonians walking the streets of Newton, Massachusetts, crazed. I remember one elderly couple, and she looked up to me with blinking eyes and said, oh, we just wanted to see them win at one time in our lifetime. And I ran across an old guy walking his dog, and he looked at me with my Red Sox cap tilted aimlessly on my head. And he said, son, this is the darkest day in this town since Jack Kennedy was shot. The Red Sox would go on to lose game seven, blowing a three-run lead. Still, it would be a simple ground ball that went through Bill Buckner's legs that would haunt Sox fans for the next 18 years. I'll never forget Vin Scully's words. There's a little roller up along first. Little roller up along first. Behind the bag. Behind the bag. Behind the bag. It gets through Buckner. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. After that, Red Sox fans were convinced that for sheer disappointment, nothing could top Buckner. And for the better part of the next two decades, they were right. It remained at the top until the seventh game of the 2003 playoffs, when the Sox blew a late three-run lead and then lost the game in the bottom of the 11th, thanks to Aaron Bleeping Boone. The Yankees go to the World Series for the 39th time in their Of course, as it had to be, it was the hated Yanks who brought Boston down. Those same Yanks who beat up the Sox in the first three games of the 2004 playoffs including a 19-8 spanking in Game 3, the worst loss in Red Sox playoff history. This is a nightmare for the Red Sox and their fans. When they were down three games to none after giving up 19 runs in Game 3. It's like a mob hit. You don't even know what hit you. We just couldn't stop the bleeding. It was cruel. Just horrific. It was devastating. No team's ever come back in the history of baseball from 3-0. I had no hope whatsoever for Game 4, and I really thought... Go to hell. I'm never watching this team again. Any Sox fan that tells you they thought that we were going to come back, and any Yankee fan who thought it was possible, at that point, is lying through their teeth. There's no point in watching the game. It's just going to prolong my agony. Why do it? But you know, I couldn't pull myself away entirely. I was watching the play through my fingers. I'm watching it like this. And we'd all be breathing. The Red Sox are three outs away from being swept. Yankee ace Mariano Rivera was ready to close down the season 
And even though pinch runner Dave Roberts was on first, the Sox hopes were slim. We were in the chair. They put the little thing on us. They were about to flip the switch. And the governor called and said, wait a minute, this guy can run. Roberts is going. Posada's throw. Roberts, safe. I can still see him sliding into second, kind of sitting up on the couch. Game's not over yet. <laughs> Keep him alive. Keep him alive. Bill Miller is at the plate. There are moments when your faith is tried and when you feel like God is hiding. I'm just praying. I'm literally praying. Mariana Rivera in the postseason, six for six, and save chances. He had two blown saves this year. And who do you think he blew them against? We have his number. He's going to give it up. All right, God, please. <laughs> this is a direct petition. Up the middle, Roberts will come to the plate. Bill Miller has tied it. And the great Mariano essentially becoming Charlie Brown and flying in the air and his clothes flying off. Three excruciating innings later, with the game still tied, David Ortiz, or Big Poppy as Sox fans called him, came through on a promise he had delivered the night before. David Ortiz commented that he saw a woman on the sidewalk and she was crying like a baby. He said, we need to turn those frowns upside down and we cannot let Red Sox Nation cry. We ain't gonna drive, keep the right, way back, and this ball is gone! He will be mobbed at home plate, and the Red Sox live to play again. I was pissed because I thought to myself, how dare you not get swept? I stopped caring. I let go. I had moved on. And now there's gonna be another game? How dare you win that game? You guys are stringing me along, aren't you? But maybe, just maybe, the Ortiz homer was a sign from above. The very moment the curse began to crack. Starting in the fourth game against the Yankees, all the things that always go against the Red Sox started to go for the Red Sox. Ortiz hits it to deep left field. Back at the monster and gone. It's a one-run game. Everything just started going our way. Nixon with a base hit to center. It just seemed like one small miracle after the next. Clark hits it into the right field corner. That ball is going to bounce and go into the seats for a ground rule double. And that could have taken a run off the board for the Yankees. The ball had hit the side of the wall. It kind of crawled up and went in there. Very odd. Talk about a fortuitous bounce for the Red Sox. Any other Red Sox year, that ball doesn't bounce into the stands. Sox lose. Two times in New York, umpires' calls are reversed in the Red Sox favor. And then to have A-Rod turn out to be a humongous goat. He swatted the ball out of the Royals' hand. He reaches out with his left hand and does this little bitch slap, this little limp-wristed slap. Slapping the ball away with those big hamburger helper gloves of his. It was such a Bush League play. It's just something you do on a playground when you were like six years old. The man I saw that one up go like this. And they're going to call him out. They got the and for him to stand there at first base and go like this. What? What? I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. What did I do? What did I do? And it's just like so un Red Sox like to see these moments unfold the same way in our favor. It was remarkable. Just incredible. It was just. Uh, astounding. The larger forces were aligned with the Red Sox this time. It all happened. Ortiz fights it off center field. David running up. Thanks to Ortiz again, Boston's good fortune had continued in game five. The Sox second straight extra inning win. And somehow, against all odds, things had gone even better in Boston's game six win at Yankee Stadium. On that night, a valiant Kurt Schilling with his mangled ankle pitched the game of his life in a red sock. My friend Tim, who's a doctor, kept calling me and telling me, this is the greatest pitching performance 
in the history of baseball. You can't make it up. You really could. We'll have to stitch his tendon on. Look at the blood on his sock. And I kept saying, I thought it was stitched. Why is there blood? And he said, there's blood. Trust me, it's blood. He blew it by the bat of Tony Clark. Achilles in the Odyssey. It's Wyatt Earp facing down the bad guys. Schilling was denying the curse with the sheer determination and willpower. He pitched through it and beyond it. We have nothing to lose. You go to game seven, there's no, literally no pressure on them. I have to admit, I still, I was still waiting for us to drop the ball. We thought the other shoe's gonna drop. When are we gonna blow it? It didn't happen. And here's Ortiz. He rips one into right field. Damon hits it in the air to right field. Sheffield back in the corner. Grand slam. And it's six nothing. It felt like that part in A Christmas Story where Ralphie finally snaps and beats up Scott Farkas. Bellhorn hits it in the right. It's fair, it's gone. It is gone. We danced on their lawn. We danced on their lawn. The thing that made me the happiest of all was that the Yankee fans were squirming. Watching the Yankee fans flee like rats deserting a sinking ship was a sight to behold. To see the Yankee fans with that look, it is so familiar in Boston. I almost felt bad because they weren't used to it. No, screw up. Let them suffer. When you're a winner, you really don't give a shit. It was so satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> Get the aftermath of that game. Just standing in front of the TV, rubbing my hands on it like it was a campfire, just feeling the glow of Yankee misery. A historic choke. Four straight. Monumental collapse. You can say it in any language you want, it's the same. Monumental collapse, it's, it's huge. It's the ultimate. I walked down the street like I was Spartacus. As a Red Sox fan living in New York, it's a wonderful thing because you get to see Yankee fans struggling with their new identity, which is ah, the greatest chokers in the history of sport. They'll never be able to erase that headline. And in this office, I'm going to have it bolted to the wall, so you have to take the entire wall out if you want to take that headline out of here. First, the Bambino is the Red Sox don't win the World Series. When they lost to the Mets, the Cardinals, those were Curse of the Bambino moments that had nothing to do with the Yankees. The curse is not over yet. They went 86 years without winning a World Series. They needed to do that. props in this thing, a part of the Red Sox story. It was a mosquito trying to stop a charging rhino. They were playing with the house's money. I was constantly in consultation with my people, saying, how can it happen this easily? It's a feeling I never anticipated. But I have to tell you, it remains beyond explanation. We're working our way toward a total lunar eclipse. Back to the mound. Fulton with it. Got him at first base. 
Sox and the Boston Red Sox can finally say it. For the first time in 86 years, for the first time since 1918, they are champions of the world. I was stunned. I don't think I saw, I, I didn't say anything. All I did, tears were just streaming down my face and I was sobbing. I, I just, I just. Um. It, 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 was it just a dream? It, it's just now becoming okay that is real, it really happened, it's just. From being clinically dead against the Yankees to coming back and winning the World Series, it was just. Mind boggling. I was in a state of shock for, well, I'm probably still in it. If it was a movie, it would be a bad movie because people would say that could never happen, it's ridiculous. It was Edgar Renteria who made the last out of the World Series was wearing number three, just like the babe, whose curse, real or imagined, was no match for the Sox in 04. It took 86 years, but the Red Sox, Boston's team, New England's team, had finally won the World Series. It lingers in the aftermaths and the present day status of people's lives like no other sports story. The Red Sox are uniquely a team of memory. The pursuit of this across 86 years through so much heartache and tears and loyalty is the perfect ending to the perfect story. When the moment finally came, everybody had somebody that they thought of. The championship was for all of the past Red Sox players. Johnny Pesky, God rest his soul, Ted Williams. The Red Sox connect people. They connect generations to a time in their life. Being a Red Sox fan is not about baseball alone. It's about family. A love for a team that brings people together and an appreciation of what links us. And so you celebrate that legacy with the person that you love, even if they're not here anymore, especially if they're not here. communication with the ghosts, with the people who wished and never saw it. We just have to go up and let him know they won. We did That's it, Poppy. Cool. We love you. We love you, Poppy. We love you, Red Sox. Thank you for doing this for us. And so when fortunes turn, they don't just turn for you, they turn for all the ghosts. And it becomes deeply emotional. It's so much associated with people you love. The world has changed, and nothing will ever be the same. And it's wonderful.
My wife is expecting twins around opening day. Those children are going to be born into a world where the Red Sox are the world champions. And that's a beautiful world to be brought into. And the Boston Red Sox are the world champions. Can you believe it? This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.